reading of the Lord's word today. Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You can take a seat. It's my pleasure today to introduce our guest speaker, Scott Pollander. Scott is currently the Director of Communications and Outreach at Caring Network. Prior to uh, serving with Caring Network, he was a pastor at Bethany Chapel out in Wheaton. If you know Wheaton College, it's that nice little one on the corner. I've always wanted to play my violin there. <laughs> um, he also resides currently in Wheaton with his uh, wife, Jody and his three daughters. So Scott, please. Good morning. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you, Aaron, for the introduction. And so, as Aaron mentioned, I work for Curing Network, which you have been a wonderful partner with and friend of. And so I have gotten to know some of you and have friends here as well. So it's really wonderful to be with you this morning and open God's word. Let's begin this morning with a word of prayer. Our Father, we ask that you would use weak people and work in weak people, helping us to hear your word, Lord. We pray that you would show us wonderful things from your word and that we would praise you, Lord, and that it would actually um, not only affect our minds, but our hearts and our wills, that, that it would move us, Lord, to love you and to serve you. And so, Father, uh, use your word this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So this psalm I read earlier this week uh, uh, in a devotional by a man named D.A. Carson, he said that this psalm, Psalm 8, is a priceless jewel. And even though every part of God's word is equally God's word, uh, and every psalm is equally God's word, some parts of scripture, some psalms stand out as exceptional. Probably some come to mind, right? Psalm 23. Uh, I think Psalm 1 and 2 Psalm 22, there's a number that just stand out to us, right? I think Psalm 8 is like that, it stands out. And that's probably why, if you've been a Christian for a while, uh, these words are probably familiar to you. They, they ring a bell. Uh, and even though it's, it's just nine verses, it is striking. And so I'm guessing as you drove to church this morning, you did not feel awe, okay? But I'm hoping that as this psalm was even read, you started to feel just a little bit of awe, a little bit of praise. Uh, and I think that is how God wants us to react. If there's an application, he wants us to praise him. This is how his glory fills the earth. And so let's look this morning at what is so striking about this psalm. If I was to ask you, what is this psalm about? You would probably say creation or humanity. It's about people. But we're given a very helpful clue about what Psalm 8 is really about. And if you look at verse 1, it says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name 
in all the earth. And this is repeated in verse 9, so that helps quite a bit. It begins and ends with this statement. And so that indicates that this is a psalm about God. It's a psalm about the glory of God. And in fact, every single verse is talking about the glory of God, except verses 7 and 8, which is talking about sheep and oxen and these sort of things. But really, that, that's about the glory of God, too, if you look at what's going on. Everything is talking about God's glory. And what is that glory? Well, from verse 1, we see that God's glory and his goodness, it's shown, it's disclosed in the created order in creation. So, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place. So God, he has made his glory. If you look at the whole context, he's made his glory visible in the earth below. But here at the beginning, uh, his glory has been made visible in the sky above. And so David, what he's saying is that all of creation displays God's glory. And if David could say that 3,000 years ago, how much more should this take our breath away? Uh, David, he did not know the unfathomable extent and scope of our universe, right? I mean, looking at the night sky with the naked eye, as David did, as we can, you only see uh, a few thousand stars at most. And so this reminds me of about 10 years ago, my, my family, my daughters were supposed to be here this morning, but my youngest was not feeling well. Uh, but I don't usually tell stories of my children, but about 10 years ago I was watching uh, the Hubble IMAX movie about the Hubble Space Telescope with my oldest. She was four years old at the time then. Uh, and at one point in the film, the, the telescope, it starts to, to close in from a great distance on the Orion Nebula and it goes past Sirius, one of the nearest stars to Earth, which is a mere 50 uh, trillion miles away. And it heads towards three little stars, Orion's belt. And it looks like really just three little specks among a thousand on the screen. And at that point, Leonardo DiCaprio says, says, distances here are so vast They're measured in light years. A single light year is almost six trillion miles. Orion is 1,500 light years away. And so the Hubble telescope is traveling at 150 trillion miles a second. And it closes in to explore a rose-colored cloud just below the belt. It's called the Orion Nebula which are clouds where amazing things happen. This gargantuan canyon of clouds is 90 trillion miles across. It's a star nursery where stars are being born. And these stars are so powerful that they create winds within the cloud canyon that howl through it at 5 million miles per hour. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And let me just say, when I was watching this, this is 10 years ago, I still remember it, because just the images were stunningly beautiful, just incredible. And Zoe was for, she did not know the difference between a dozen and a trillion, but her mouth was wide open. And honestly, I don't think any of us here really, our minds can grasp much the difference between a dozen and a trillion, frankly but my mouth, my jaw was wide open. And so I called uh, my wife down and I just wanted her to see a bit of it and she just watched a a few minutes of it and her reaction was, "What what is man that you are mindful of him? It was like she almost knew this scripture. It was just a wonderful thing. Um, Our galaxy alone is one of about a million galaxies in the optical range of our most powerful telescopes. We're going to talk about telescopes. I could talk about microscopes today, too. It's incredible. 
but this is just one of about a million such galaxies. It's estimated that in our galaxy, there's somewhere between 200 and 400 billion stars. That's a lot of stars. But our neighboring galaxy, Andromeda, appears to contain a trillion or more stars. Uh, our sun, it is just a, a very modest star. It burns about 6,000 degrees centigrade on the surface, and it travels at an orbit of 135 miles per second, which means that it, take, it would take about 250 million years to do one revolution around the galaxy. I mean, our, our sun is just a modest star, and you know how many Earths fit within our sun? A million. They say a million Earths fit within our, our tiny little sun. <laughs> um, oh, Lord. A recent estimate of the total number of galaxies in the universe is between 150 and 200 billion. But astronomers, this is a quote from an astronomer, says, what we know barely scratches the surface of what we don't know. Think about that. Amazing. One estimate is around uh, 100 septillion stars. I don't know what septillion is, but one, one septillion stars. And that the estimated radius of the universe is 46 billion light years. A light year, again, is about 5.88 trillion miles. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glories above the heavens. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? And so I, I told you, I think that what was the reaction watching it, even of, of my daughter, but especially my wife's reaction, what was that reaction? Praise. I think it was praise. And I think you may even be, maybe driving to church you didn't feel that. But as we read scripture and as we're thinking about this, I think what we should feel is awe and wonder and praise. But if the heavens fill you with awe and praise, what follows is even more incredible in this psalm. Because this psalm is less impressed with the size of the universe in verse 3, it calls it the work of your fingers. The work of your fingers. It doesn't even take hands or arms. It's just God's fingers. It's like he just spoke it and it's there. It's almost as if, it's amazing, but it's almost as if David is not as impressed with that as what follows. Um, and in verses 3 through 8, we see what is even more incredible is the value and dignity of man. Here, uh, I think what David says, it is so surprising, it is so counterintuitive that God's glory is seen even more in creation, not in the heavens, but in God's creation of mankind, in God's creation of men and women. And so the answer to how God displays his glory in creation and makes his name majestic, what David is saying is it is through weak people, sinful people, human weakness. Uh, I mean, surprising, counterintuitive. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him. Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands and have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. And you probably... Uh, that jars, stirs up thoughts. I mean, David here, he is alluding to Genesis chapter 1 when God created the heavens and the earth. And Genesis 1 tells us that the pinnacle of creation 
is not the creation of the stars and planets. The pinnacle of creation is the creation of man and woman. Incredible that God says that of us. It's, it's counterintuitive because David, here he is both emphasizing uh, human weakness and vulnerability. I think we can almost sense that. He's talking about human weakness. He's talking about how little it insignificant it seems that we are, what appears to be insignificant. And yet what he is saying is that men and women are incredibly significant. Isn't that surprising? Uh, the, the pinnacle of creation. God created man and woman to rule his creation. And as verse 6 says, God has given them dominion, dominion or rule. And so here we come to the central question of this psalm. Verse 4. What is man? What is man? And the key to understand in that question is uh, in verse five, God made him. That is absolutely key. Uh, you may be aware that this may be, it, it very likely is the key debate going on in our culture right now. What is man? And our, our culture believes that man is just an animal. That we decide um, what a man and woman is. We deny that God made him, as verse 5 says, that God made them male and female. And as Genesis 1 teaches, um, this denial that, that, God, that man is created in God's image, it actually, in Western culture, this denial is actually more and more leading us to treat other people like animals, to ourselves act, not as as those who rule God's creation, but as beasts. You, have may, have, you may have heard a senator in the uh, hearings with the Supreme Court nominee ask the question this past week, what is a woman? And her response was, I'm not a biologist. And, and it's true. Biology does answer, what is a man? What is a man? What is a woman? It has something to say about it. Um, there's other areas, psychology. Sociology has something to say about what is a man. Anthropology certainly has something to say about what is a man. But none of these can give a satisfactory answer without a Bible in hand. None can explain why humans are different than animals apart from the scriptures. And this psalm focuses on the place of human beings in this God-created, this God-centered universe. So what is man? And according to verses, three through, three, or verses 5 through 8, it says God made him. That is what man, man is created by God. And he is crowned with glory and honor. Genesis 1 says, So God created man in his image, in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So man is made by God. He is crowned with glory and honor because he is not like the animals. He is like God and that he is in the image of God. And this is why mankind is also, we are called to exercise rule and dominion uh, in God's creation and to do it well. So God who in verse one, he says his glory is above the heavens. The heavens cannot contain God, we're told in scripture repeatedly. The heavens cannot contain God. Uh, made man a little lower than the angels at creation. In verse five, he crowned him with glory and honor. And David, David is astonished by this. He is in awe that God is mindful of men and women, that God has compassion for us. And that, that really, what is this showing? It's showing God, God's care for us. 
that God sees us, that God knows us, that this God who flung the, the stars into space can count the hairs on our head. Um, and so the dominant tone in this psalm is wonder. It is praise at, at who God is. It is full of awe and joy. But it also does not overlook the evil in the world. I, I think Shay prayed about the evils going on in the world that we see every day. And the scriptures are not naive about this. And either is Psalm 8. We know that Genesis 3 onward in the Bible, that God reject, or that, that man rejected God's rule. And so when, man, when, when men and women reject God's authority, um, he becomes a beast or a monster or an animal. And our rule is only done well under God's authority as we submit ourselves to God. Uh, human authority works where divine authority is recognized. And we are losing that in Western culture. We're losing that in our nation, in our community. And so when this happens, the results are not pretty. Uh, Psalm 8 is quoted in Hebrews chapter 2. And in Hebrews 2, it, it recognizes just how far short man has fallen in the purpose and creation of dominion, of rule. And this, in Hebrews 2, it talks about this psalm as being fulfilled in Jesus. This is what it says. It says, now putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he for whom and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. And so the, the New Testament tells us that the heavens, even the highest heavens, cannot contain God. God is infinite. And yet God, this infinite God, became finite. How does that work? I mean, somehow the infinite is in the finite without exploding. It's, it's another just mystery. It's incredible. Uh, God became a human being and, and Jesus becoming a man and dying for men and women is another way that this psalm in Hebrews 2, it points to humanity, men and women being valuable. Isn't that incredible? That God himself, God did not, of all of creation, it even says the angels, God, you know the angels are not redeemed? God did not become an angel to die for angels. The fallen angels God left. But fallen men and women, he has redeemed all of us. He became a man and died for our sin. Thank you, Lord. God showed his care and love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so... It's no wonder that David, he doesn't know, he doesn't know the full picture, right, as, as the writer of the Hebrews does, but that should lead us to prayer, to praise, to wonder. And Hebrews 2 says, why did Jesus do that? To bring many sons to glory, to make it so that we are like Christ, sons and daughters who actually follow God and serve him and rule well, lead families, church, communities well. Um, and so I want to close this morning by looking at the one verse in here that is not like the others. There is one verse that is not like the others. You probably picked that up, but verse 2, look at verse 2. It talks about foes and enemies and crying babies. It says, out of the mouths of babies and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. So what in the world 
does this mean? What in the world does this have to do with any of this? And again, we know that going back to Genesis 3, man has rejected, we know in our own hearts that we reject God's rule at times as well. But man rejected God's rule and there is enmity between the serpent's offspring and God's offspring, the woman's offspring, meaning Jesus. And we see this everywhere in the Psalms. And so um, Psalm 1 and 2 are an introduction to the Psalms, but Psalm 8 is right in the middle of a bunch of Psalms where you see everywhere two things, enemies pursuing God's King David, the Messiah and his people, and also crying, crying, tears. And so um, there are enemies of God. And Psalm 2 uh, is very important to understanding what's going on in Psalm 8. It says, why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and his anointed, saying, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. So the rulers are plotting against God. They have rejected his authority. And what we see when that happens is they rule like monsters. They are enemies of God. They're enemies of God's people. They are enemies of, of humanity when this happens. Do I have to give examples? There are many. Um, but God is indicating in Psalm 8 that this is an important psalm because it's in the middle of all of these psalms which are full of crying. Look at, uh, if you have your Bible open, look at Psalm 3, a psalm of David. He says, oh Lord, how, verse 1, oh Lord, how many are my foes? Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. Verse 4, I cried aloud to the Lord and he answered me from his holy hill. Uh, chapter 4, verse 1, answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. The next chapter, tears as well. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my groaning. Give attention to the sound of my cry, my God and King. For to you do I pray. And then verse 6. Verse 6, it's everywhere um, from the very first verse. But if you look at verse 6, I am weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with weeping. And chapter seven, verse one, O Lord, my God, I do, in you do I take refuge. Save me from all my pursuers and deliver me. And so these chapters are filled with enemies and tears, verse two. Now in, in nine, chapter nine through 14, Psalm nine through 14, you see the same thing, enemies of God and his people, of Christ and his people, and tears everywhere. And so right in the middle of all of these chapters is Psalm 8. And it is just uh, very significant because Satan hates God and the rulers of the nations hate God. They throw off his shackles. And when they do this, why would this verse be right in the middle of all this crying out to God, all these tears? It's because what we see in the world, in Ukraine right now, what you see in the world is that when rulers do this, children are always victims. They are always caught in the crossfire. Out of the mouths and babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. And almost every time infants are mentioned, in the Old Testament, this is very significant. When babies and infants are mentioned in the Old Testament, they are almost always crying, almost always. And so what is coming out of the mouths of these little ones? If you have the NIV, it's translated praise because that's what Jesus in Matthew 21, he's saying they're praising. But I think this is a double meaning actually. Uh, God defenses, defeats his enemies through the praise of children but also, I think in the context here, it is the cries, the cries um, that are coming from these little ones. And so it is 
There's reason to believe this for, for a lot of reasons, the context in the Old Testament, but at the greatest points in salvation, in the Old Testament, the greatest point is the Exodus, and the great deliverer was Moses. What did Satan do? And then the rulers of the nations, Pharaoh, what do they do to little ones when God is working salvation? They slaughter them. They slaughter them. And the New Testament Exodus event, which all of Scripture points to, is the birth of Jesus, the, the life, the death, the resurrection. But when Jesus comes, what does Herod do? It's infants who are slaughtered once again. It's no coincidence that at the great points in salvation, we see uh, the cries of little ones. And so in our state alone right now in Illinois, last year there were as many abortions in our state as there were in the 11 years, uh, combat deaths in the 11 years in Vietnam. Some of you may be aware of that. That is our state. And we think that God does not hear the cries of infants, but the God who has created the whole universe, he knows, he sees, he cares, he cares. Uh, he knows that Satan is a murderer who hates God and hates his image bearers who God loves. But God has conquered his enemies. It is not as we expected. Jesus defeated his enemies by becoming a human being, by taking the shame and weakness of a cross. Again, this is consistent with what Hebrews, but Psalm 8 says, this weakness. He has made enemies like us. He has made us friends through the cross, through his son, saving sinners like us. And he is working in weak people, in sinful people who have been redeemed. He is working in us to tell people this good news, but also to work for those, the weak in the world, who uh, need others to be a voice for them and also to cry out for them. And so uh, I want to thank you for your partnership with Caring Network. Um, there are many applications I could give as we close, but I just want to close with one question and one application. Do you feel weak? As you look at the troubles in your own life, the sin in your own life, when you look out at the world, as, as Shay talked about, the the troubles in the world, the sin in the world, do you feel weak? And that is okay because the way that God is working in the world according to Psalm 8 is not through strength. The God who spoke a, a universe into existence that is 40 billion light years in radius has chose, chosen to work in this world through weakness and through us. Can you even believe that? Can you even believe that? Um, and so though we are surrounded by bad news, it is very, very good news that God cares about all that is happening. He sees all that is happening. And he cares about the weak. He cares about even little babies. He cares about the weak. He sees and he is hearing, he is answering the prayers. Um, God cares about his creation. He cares about us. And he is including us. He is working in the world through the weak things of the world, his people. And so let's close with a word of prayer. Father, our Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Father, we praise you that you see weak and sinful men and women, and yet you have made enemies friends, and more than friends, children. Father, I pray that you would truly continue to work in us, that we would be made like the Lord Jesus, and that we would love righteousness uh, that we would be just people and that we would be merciful people and not ignore the weak and those who you see and listen to. Father, please 
um, I pray that you would bless Grace Bible and that you would use them to reach many people and to make a huge difference. Um, I thank you in closing just for their heart for the unborn child. I pray, Lord, that you would use them greatly, continue to use them to save many lives and also to bring women and men into the kingdom uh, through our partnership with Caring Network. Father, we give you praise and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.